for those of you that are back. Um, thank you for coming back after lunch. We have a great lineup for this afternoon, so we're just going to go ahead and get started. Uh, our next speaker is Laura Schumann, and she's with the Parks and Recreation Department. She is an arborist, and she is the acting urban forestry program manager right now, so she's got a lot to carry on her shoulders. Um, she lived in Wyoming, and she had a tree care company. She's um, an, an ISA certified arborist, and she's really fabulous to work with. Please welcome Laura Schumann. Hi, everybody. Um, I'm going to give you a little bit more background on me, so oops, hopefully you can hear me, um, so you understand why you have me here talking to you about pruning. Uh, as Denise said, I had a tree care business with my husband for many years in this little small town in Wyoming, although I'm actually a native Austinite. I was born and raised here, um, so now I'm back home. So when I worked the tree care company with my husband, I was actually out there with a chainsaw driving a dump truck every day. So I actually did the work, and I learned a lot from that. We were lucky enough to have um, a really good clientele that called us back time after time. Um, and because of that, we really were able to learn from some of our own mistakes, and definitely mistakes that people had done uh, coming ahead of us. So that's one of the best ways that I learned what works and what doesn't work. It's just from trying it, and then 5, 10, 20 years later, seeing what the tree looks like. So I have a lot of material to cover today. I, I really was ambitious in this talk. Um, I'm going to try to cover pruning just in general and then pruning young trees for structure and also get into some root pruning. So we'll get going. First of all, why, why does it matter? You know, why are we here talking about trees at all? Well, everybody knows that trees do a lot of good for, for us, um, for everything. Of course, they're out there producing oxygen, cleaning in our, our air. They help with stormwater um, runoff. They help to, to capture carbon and sequester it in the environment. They do crazy things like lower crime rates in neighborhoods where you have more tree canopy um, and lower obesity rates, things you would never expect. So that's why it's so important that we take care of our trees because they're really super uh, good creatures. Because they do all these things, trees are worth a lot of money. You know, not only um, are they worth, uh, you know, whatever you value that tree at for the shade it's giving you and the energy bills that it's saving you, but you can have a tree appraised and that tree may be worth thousands of dollars. I helped with an appraisal on kind of an average sized pecan tree that was in good shape uh, in the right of way on one of our city properties. It came out um, in fair condition, not even in good condition at $14,000. So trees are worth a lot of money. Uh, and so if you're out there doing anything to them, it's good for you to be aware of that. And of course, lastly, trees are living creatures. Um, I know I drive my husband crazy because I have way too many plants that I make him pack in and out of the house every time it's going to freeze. And it's because I think of them as living creatures that I'm responsible for. Trees are the same way. Um, and, you know, if you're caring for somebody else's trees, they may be very, very important to them for maybe grandma planted that tree. Um, so it's good for you to really think about how important they are. And, and they are living. And because they're living, they change. They're dynamic. But we as people can do a lot more harm than good to trees. Um, <laughs> I know this is one of those pictures that just hurts a little to look at. You know, they tried to save this tree. They really tried to do the right thing. But unfortunately, they just didn't save enough of that root ball. Uh, so I doubt this tree is going to make it long term. So keep in mind that any time you do anything to a tree, you may be helping it, you may be hurting it. Um, when we do work on trees, uh, and if you do things that are, aren't good for the tree, you can take something that's an asset that's worth a lot of money and turn it into a liability. Now, of course, this is going to happen on its own with age, with decay, but it also can happen as a result of really poor pruning practices. Um, so just want to warn you about that, especially if you're in the business where you may be out and, and touching other people's trees. Okay, so now we're going to get into the heart of it. Um, first, I'm going to start talking about some pruning basics. And I love this picture because it makes me think of Pac-Man. And it's like this tree is getting revenge on those power lines. Um, <laughs> obviously, this is not the ideal way that you want to prune a tree, but sometimes you have to prune for a specific obje objective, like clearance for power lines. And sometimes this is what <laughs> happens. Okay, if you take nothing else away from this today, I want you to remember this point, that trees can't heal. 
they're incapable of healing. Um, you know, you and I, we get a cut, a wound. Eventually, we may end up with a scar, but eventually the tissues are going to repair themselves. You know, that wound won't be there anymore. You might just have a little bit of a scar. A tree can't do that. Any wound that you make on the tree is going to be in that tree for the rest of its life. What a, wound, what a tree does is it builds walls as quickly as it can. There's technically four of them, but that doesn't really matter. Um, and just tries to close over that wound and wall it off before decay can get in. Pretty much all decay in trees is fungal, um, and it can spread really quickly and easily. It's out there in the environment. I know this picture is just a little bit blurry, but I think it really um, does show you that that tree in that cross section still has that pruning wound that was made many, many years past, and it was able to successfully close over it. You can see the outer wall there. Let me try out my pointer thingy. Well, that's not going to work up there. All right, I'll do my best to describe what I'm, what I'm talking about. So anytime you prune a tree, you're causing wounds. So it's just really important to keep in mind that that wound is going to be there the entire life of that tree. It's never going to go away. If the tree is successful, it will close over that wound. It'll build that wall, um, and it will close it out before decay gets in. If not, you may be looking at a spot where the tree may eventually break. Another good thing to keep in mind is that trees produce all their own food. Um, we think of, of fertilizers as plant food, but they're not really plant food. They're more like a plant... Um, uh, calcium pill or vitamin pill. Um, they're nutrients that the tree needs, but they're not food. All of that food that a tree will ever get in its entire lifetime, it's going to make through photosynthesis in its leaves. So when you're pruning a tree, you're cutting off leaves. So you want to think about that. You're reducing its ability to produce its food. So you want to minimize that as much as possible. When you're pruning, you need to always prune for a specific goal. Uh, that's really, really important to keep in mind and make that plan at the beginning uh, before you ever get a saw out or, or pruning shears or anything. Um, because of all those reasons, wounding, uh, redu reduction of food making capacity, you don't want to do anything that you don't have to do. You want to keep it at a bare minimum. So always make sure, like in this case, they're going to prune for si sidewalk clearance. There are some things that you can do when you prune a tree to help uh, minimize the wounding and help that tree to close over that wound as quickly as possible. Trees have tissues that surround most branches called a branch collar. It's that swollen tissue um, right outside of where a branch attaches to the trunk or a parent branch. You want to keep that tissue and not cut it off when you make your pruning cuts. The reason for this are there are cells um, in that swollen tissue that actually are designed to uh, multiply quicker and help to close over that wound quicker. So sometimes it's really easy to see the swollen tissue. And if you can see it, you just want to make your cut right outside of it. You can see uh, to the, the branch on the left, you can kind of see that swelling and make your cut right outside of that. Sometimes some tree species, some just in general, some trees, it's really difficult to uh, see that swollen tissue. Some, because of some branch structure, this tissue may not exist in certain places uh, or not exist to, to the extent that we see it in others. So in order to help you have a guideline of where to make that cut, um, you can look for some cues in the tree. There is an area between the branch and another branch or the branch in the trunk where you'll see that kind of ridge that forms. It's called a branch bark ridge. That's where the, the bark between the parent stem or the trunk and the, and the branch are kind of pushing against each other and pushing out a little bit, and it makes that swollen ridge. So if you don't see the collar, look for that ridge, and then make a mirror image cut to that at the same angle on the outside of the tree branch. So just think of a straight line cutting that in half and then exactly mirror image cut on the other side. Um, and if there are any of those good tissues there, you're going to preserve them if you make the cut in that spot. Oh, thank you. Okay, so this is just to show you what a branch collar looks like in a re real tree. And this one is really easy to see. You just make that cut right where he's making it, um, and, and, and that will preserve your good tissues. Sometimes, though, it's just hard to see those. But you do want to avoid this. What happens when you, when you tear uh, the branch is, first of all, you're tearing off some of those good tissues that you want to keep. You're also making a much larger wound, and it's much harder for the tree to close over that wound. 
So there's some, some cutting te techniques you can use to prevent that from happening. This happens frequently when you're pruning off a really long, overextended branch um, or maybe a really heavy branch. So there's a simple method. It's called the three-part um, cutting method where you go out away from where you're going to make your final cut and you make an undercut first, about a third of the way up, not much further or you'll end up getting your, your saw stuck. Then you come out at the top and go out a little further on that branch and cut that branch off. Your undercut will prevent the tearing from happening. After that, you're going to have a stub and you can go back and just cut that stub off um, wherever the proper place to make that cut is. That just helps to prevent those big tears. Oh, and I do want to point out, I hate this picture, but I use it anyway because it's, for some reason, the best one I have of this. But obviously, the third cut there looks a little flush to me. I think they must have cut off the branch collar in that picture, so don't do that. Okay, I'm, I'm going to talk about a few uh, pruning methods that are kind of common but are really bad for trees. The first one is lion's tailing. I see this unfortunately really frequently in Austin. Um, why it's called lion's tailing is because it's when you strip off all the inner branches and just leave a tuft of growth out at the end of a, a tree branch, like a lion's tail. The problem with this uh, is a couple things. First of all, you've now redistributed all the weight out to the end of that branch. When wind blows, normally all those inner branches help to distribute the wind as it moves through the tree. Now you've redistributed all that weight to the end, and it's much more likely that that branch is going to break in a big windstorm. Another major problem about this is that if you ever need to reduce that tree, because maybe the branches are now up in the power lines, or they're you know, getting into your roof, or for whatever reason, maybe it's dying back because of the drought, and you need to take some of the ends off that have died back, you have nothing left to cut it off to. There's no other branches to cut back to. Uh, your only choice would be made to make another really bad cut, I'll talk about it in a minute, or, or take it all the way back to the trunk. Um, also, now you have wounds all over that branch, and those wounds may decay and may make even weaker spots that now are, are going to make it extra likely to, to break in a windstorm. So you want to avoid this. Climbers tend to do it because it makes it a lot easier to climb. Your ropes don't have as much stuff to get tangled in. Over pruning. Um, Unfortunately, this is pretty common. And like I said, trees are, or leaves are food factories. They need these leaves to feed themselves. If you cut off too many, the tree is going to respond by sh sending out a lot of shoots. Uh, there's dormant buds all over a tree. Um, those are being suppressed by in buds uh, on the ends of branches and twigs. When you cut off too many of those, that tree is going to just react like crazy and send out as many new leaves as it can to try to make up for that loss. This is one of our city trees. Uh, luckily, it's not a park tree. This is a right-of-way tree, so my, my crews aren't responsible for this. But it's near my house. I unfortunately didn't get a picture of it before it had its first dosage of pruning. I just noticed it after I drove along and saw this. So obviously, it must have been um, having some sort of sight obstruction. There's that, that stop sign, and it's a weird intersection. But you can see they pruned off way too much of the live crown of this tree. When they did that, it just suckered out like crazy. It really backfired on them because now it looks like it has a bush growing there. <laughs> and it made the obstruction even worse. So what happened? Somebody called it in to 311 again because they couldn't see. And they came back and had to prune it again. Um, not only did they just take off all those suckers, but you can't really tell this from this picture, but I could tell it as I drove by. They cut off one more limb that was about this big around in diameter all the way up in the crown that wasn't blocking anything. I don't know why they did that, but it took off even more live growth. So now it's been pruned twice when it really only needed to be pruned once. Um, it's really stressed. It doesn't have the capability to make the food it needs, so it's going to be more likely to get insect and disease problems. Um, trees uh, uh, react to stress just like people do. It suppresses your immune system. The same sort of thing happens to trees. And look at this. This is what I saw at the, at the end of the fall season last year before winter. I know it's really hard to see on the thing, but believe me, there's new sprouts coming out all over that trunk. And I bet you this spring it's going to be covered again just like it was last, last year, last fall. So um, it's just backfiring, and it's going to be more expensive for the city to have to deal with this. So if you're a homeowner, this is definitely a problem because you're going to be paying way more money than you should have to have this tree pruned. Um, and if you're a company that's taking care of the tree, this is really bad for your reputation. The homeowner's not going to be pleased with this. And it's really hard on these trees. 
Okay, so I think I'm almost off my soapbox here with the bad printing cuts, but topping is one I definitely want to mention. Um, this, this picture I actually like because I think it's kind of pretty. The colors are nice. But uh, this is a very bad way to prune a tree. First of all, you've cut off all of those branch collars. You're just making ind indiscriminate, uh, excuse me, indiscriminate cuts, not back to another branch, not back to the trunk. Um, those spots are very likely to decay. Let me show you what happens. So, um, as you can see in this picture, ooh, I now have a new toy. Uh -huh. I think it still won't work on the screen. Uh, oh, well. Okay, so, uh, would you make those topping cuts? It's going to respond by sending out shoots, new sprouts, to try to make up for that leaf loss. Um, the, the buds are now no longer suppressed, so they can grow. But they're really shallowly rooted, so to speak, on that tree. You can see then this cross section, it's already started to decay because it couldn't close over that wound, and there's those sprouts growing off of it. Um, in, the, in the picture on the right, you can really see the, all the sprouts that come off in the spot that can't close over. Um, this is super problematic when we're talking about big trees. This is a cottonwood tree. I know it's kind of an odd angle. We're up in the tree, and I'm, I'm looking down at one of the main crotches of the tree. Um, that is a, a rotten spot. It's all filled with water because of, you know, it just collects water there. And all of those branches are great big branches. I mean, we're talking these branches are like this big that are coming off of that spot. Multiple branches all pretty shallowly attached. They're not, they don't, their fibers aren't interconnected like a branch really should be if it were growing there from the beginning of that tree's life. Um, they're, they're kind of on the outside. And then we're, we're there working on this tree because it started to drop these branches. And if you look really closely, you can see a woman down there below on the street. That's my mom. She'd come up to visit us and was just checking out what we were doing that day. But it's really scary. There's a branch down there. You can see one of those giant branches that had broken off. This wasn't a storm. This wasn't wind. It just snapped off because of decay. So if you think you're making a tree safer by cutting its top off and making it shorter, it may be for the short time. But as soon as it sprouts back and, back and starts to grow, you're going to make it way, way more dangerous than it ever was before. So if you prune a tree correctly, you're hardly going to be able to tell that anybody was there and anybody was doing work. When I first started working in the tree business, they kind of get, uh, homeowners would kind of um, gauge whether you're doing a good job or not by how much brush you were taking off. You know, they love to see that giant pile of brush in your brush truck. Um, what I realized, though, is that's not, not the best way to prune a tree. You have to have an objective. You're not just going in there to thin it just randomly. You want to take care of dead wood, broken, cracked limbs, that kind of thing. Raise it, maybe um, you know, get it out of your roof and your power lines. But really, when you're done with that tree, uh, it shouldn't look drastically different than it did before you started. Whoops. Um, and since you're, if you ever do work on either protected size trees or, or city trees, I want to just give you a heads up about permits in the city. Any tree in the city that is 19 inches in diameter or greater, and that's at four and a half foot off the ground. So across the trunk at four and a half foot off the ground, if it measures 19 inches and greater, even if it's dead, it requires a permit to be removed. That's city ordinance. Uh, you can get that permit on the City Arborist website. Um, I've got the link down there at the bottom, but if you just go to the uh, austintexas.gov website, you can follow the links there. There's a tree portal. Um, the, only, the only exception to this would be if it's an imminent failure. If you have a tree that's breaking apart, falling over right now, and it's a serious safety concern, it's okay to go ahead and get that tree on the, on the ground and then contact the City Arborist office just so they know that everything's on the up and up. Um, we have very, very active tree lovers in Austin. I have to warn you, people will call you in if they think you're illegally removing a tree. So make sure you cover all your bases. And even if you're not really sure if the tree is big enough, go ahead and call them. They're really great there, and they'll help you figure that out. Now, if you ever do any work on public trees, so these are either trees in city parkland or on you know, city property, or they may be a tree that's growing in the right-of-way in front of your house. So the first few feet of the property from the street into your property line um, is owned by the city. It's the right-of-way. It varies throughout town. On average, it's going to be about 10 foot, but that really does vary quite a bit. Um, sometimes you can tell by the seam, the first seam in the concrete in your driveway. That's generally where your right-of-way starts. 
So if you're working on a tree that's past that in, in between that line and the street, that's a city-owned tree. So if you want to, you could just call 311 and have the city come and deal with it. Uh, the city's pretty backed up. Public Works takes care of those trees. So you may have clients that don't want to wait that long. If so, that's fine. Um, you know, you can, you can do the work as a professional company for them. You just, it just requires a public tree care permit. I'm actually the one that processes these, per these permits. You get them at the same place that you can get the city arborist one off the city website. Um, you know, just make sure you cover your bases. Even if there's a question, I'll be sure to tell you if, oh, no, it's not a, a city tree. It's fine. Um, and if you want to do any work in a park, volunteer work, anything like that, uh, the same thing is required. All right. Now I'm going to talk about pruning young trees for structure. This is my husband. This is just to remind you that we're lucky that we live in Austin where it doesn't snow. Because raking through snow is really tough, and I forget about it every year, and then the snows would come, and I was like, oh, no, here it goes again. So the reason that you want to plant a tree, or excuse me, prune a tree when it's young is because you can do a lot to fix bad structural problems when a tree is young before it's gotten to be big. Um, this is one of the main structural problems that we run into in urban trees. They're called codominant stems. Basically, it's when you have more than one stem, more than one tree trunk coming out of the same place um, and often very close in size to one another. And what happens with these is that instead of the branches having that wonderful interconnected tissues where they're really holding on to one another, instead, those stems are pushing away from one another. And often they'll have bark that grows down in between that will further uh, push the tree away from one another and make it so it's a place where the tree is very likely to split. That, that tree on the left is a city of Austin tree. Um, actually, it's privately owned, but growing in the city. And you can see the homeowner tried. They knew it was starting to split, so they put that strap on there. Wood, nearly enough. There was so much weight up in the canopy of that tree. It was just falling apart and a real big safety issue, so we had to take it down. Those are the ones that it's really scary to have my husband climb. When we lived in Wyoming, we had a bucket truck, and we wouldn't get him up in one of these. Now that we're here, we sold that, and uh, I don't like to put him up in those. The one on the right is um, a giant, big, white poplar tree. They don't grow here. This is in Wyoming. It had two big stems, and you can see all that bark that had grown down in between those stems. And same thing happened. It just started to split apart. Luckily, we had cabled it years before, and that cable caught the two stems before they actually split, so we were able to get it down before it fell because it was right in between two homes. But if you make a few small pruning cuts when the tree is young, you can prevent that from happening. Another reason to prune when a tree is young is you're going to make smaller wounds on the tree. And, for, you know, I, I talked all about wounding. Um, if you can make a smaller cut, the way trees grow is they have living tissue around the outside, and in the heart, the heartwood, is really dead tissue. That's not living, producing sugars or anything like that. It's really this, just there for structure and support. All the living tissue is on the outside. That's why you can kill a tree by cutting a ring around it and just cutting that live tissue that's moving waters up and sugars down. Well, on young trees, on small limbs, most of the tissue hasn't become that heartwood yet. It's living tissue. So sapwood, the living tissue, can grow much more quickly and close over wound quickly. So anytime you make a small wound, it's much more likely that tree is going to recover from that. So when you get ready to make pruning cuts on a small tree, it's really, really important to have a plan. What you're going to do and, and how that's going to impact the tree for the rest of its life. So just remember that this tree, this is a little red oak, it has the capability to become this tree. That's a big tree. You can see the woman standing there. I mean, a red oak has a huge potential. It can be a really, really big tree. And so can many of our other trees that we plant. And, you know, they may be this little five-gallon thing. They may be uh, 20 foot tall right now. They could get to be much, much bigger. So not only do you want to think about this when you're picking your species to plant and where you're going to put it, but also you want to think about it when you're making a plan to prune. A lot of the branches that are on a small tree are actually temporary. If you really think about it, a branch that's down here on a young tree is going to be in that same place for the rest of its life. That's what my little uh, Christmas ornament on my tree drawing is, is illustrating. Hopefully you can see it on that screen. Um, as the tree ages, branches stay in the same spot. They don't grow up. They just get bigger around. 
the tree is putting off growth from the top, and that's why it's getting taller. But if a tree branch is right here when the tree is young, it's going to be right there the rest of its life. So that may be a temporary branch when you plant that tree. You may not want that branch in that spot. It may be where your car is going to go in your driveway, or you don't want to hit it with your head if you're mowing the lawn. So when you're looking at those little trees, think about that some of those branches there on that tree you may want to remove later in the tree's life. So when you're making your plan for how you're going to prune this little tree, the first thing you want to do is look for a main leader. Now, often on the stock you're going to get from the nursery, it's really common that they head those trees back, that they cut the tops out of the trees when they're little to stimulate growth because a lot of their customers like to see a lot of branches on their trees. They don't want to see a spindly tree. In reality, the spindly tree is way better when it's young, but people don't realize that. So often the stock that you're going to get is going to have a lot of um, upright branches that are competing to be that leader. So just pick one of them. It doesn't matter. Um, sometimes it might be kind of going off to the side. Sometimes it might be nice and straight. But whichever one you pick, identify that as your main leader. And then look for anything that's competing with that. So that might be other branches that are growing really upright rather than out. Um, or maybe they're about the same height or maybe even taller. Um, look for temporary branches, as I talked about, branches that you know may not stay on that tree the rest of its life. And then anything that's crossing that may rub on itself, that may create a wound that can't close, um, or, of course, anything that's dead or broken. So once you kind of have that plan in your head, okay, this is my plan of attack for this tree, you can go ahead and start making cuts. Um, what you want to do is any that you've identified as being your uh, temporary or competing for lead, you want to reduce them. So um, hopefully you can see those little red marks. That's where I've decided I'm going to make my pruning cuts. Now, the reason I'm not just going to go ahead and cut those branches all the way off altogether is that you need the sugars that are being produced by those to help feed the trunk and make what we call good trunk taper. Basically, you want a trunk to be wider at the bottom than it is at the top to make a nice stable tree. So you just make little cuts to reduce the length of those branches that you've identified are temporary or competing. Over time, you need to keep this process up. Ideally, and if you establish a good rapport with a client, you'd want to come back every two years or so and make another few cuts. And, and if you explain to them what you're doing, they're, they're going to be a lot more inclined to have you do that. So keep in mind what, you know, where you're going to want those trees and, or those limbs as they're growing. Some may you want to keep on there for a little bit longer, so you just reduce them again, make another round of cuts. Then as that tree grows... You're going to push that, the, the growth up where you want it, up above people's heads. And slowly over time, those lower branches may get shaded out all on their own and, and start to die off on their own. Or after they've, they've been on for a while and helped that trunk to grow bigger, you can go ahead and cut them off. What you're doing when you cut back and reduce those limbs is you're taking off leaves. And as you take off leaves, the, the tree is going to be producing less sugars from that branch. So it's going to feed that branch less. That will keep the diameter of that little branch smaller rather than it getting bigger as the tree, branch, or the tree trunk grows. So when you do make that final cut, it's a smaller cut. Um, another thing that you do when you do this, especially if you're reducing something up top that's competing with that main leader, is you're opening up sunlight for the main leader so that it can produce even more sugars and, and it can really take over the dominance and grow upright and nice and strong. But you do need to be careful and not take too much off. You know, I showed you the, the more mature tree that somebody had taken too much off of. This is one of our little park trees. I don't know what happened to this guy. It's really sad. Um, you know, obviously it's got very poor structure now because it, it's um, not got any trunk taper. It doesn't have any lower limbs to feed that trunk, and it probably just isn't going to make it. They took off so much of the live growth, it, it may not be able to sustain itself. So do be careful, and, and if you can, leave branches low down on the tree for as long as possible. All right. Come on. There we go. Whoops. All right, I'm switching gears. I know I'm going quickly, so I'm sorry about that. If there's time, you can ask me questions at the end. Um, I'm going to talk about roots. This is one of my favorite trees in Austin. If you've never been out to Commons Ford, it's a park that's way out southwest Austin. 
it is a beautiful place. You can swim there. It's lovely. And this is this amazing live oak tree that grows there. So I just used it because I really like this tree. Not sure what I'm supposed to be pointing at to make this go. Here we go. All right. So the first thing to keep in mind before you ever think about cutting a root is how roots grow and what they're doing for the tree. Um, a lot of us tend to think of roots as looking like a mirror image below ground as above ground, but that's not really the case. Roots grow shallow in the soil and they go, grow really, really wide. The reason for this is that roots need oxygen and oxygen is found in that top layer of soil, um, especially if it's not been really compacted and there's nice particle space, nice, nice space between the soil particles where air can grow. That's where you're gonna find your roots. And sometimes they'll grow out way, way beyond the drip line of that tree, um, beyond the canopy of the tree. Anywhere that they can find oxygen and water and soil, they'll grow. But they're gonna be, uh, usually it's no more than 12 inches deep. Some species do get a little bit deeper, and if you've got nice rich soils, they may be deeper, but often it's just that top layer of soil. Um, so it's, it's good to keep this in mind. If you drive over these roots, you can squash them and kill them and you can compact those soils. Um, but if you're gonna be doing any kind of work, any kind of construction, landscape design, other plant installations, um, you may be digging, cutting where there are roots for a tree. And anytime you do that, you're reducing the capacity of that tree to take up water and nutrients from the soil. So sometimes you may need to prune some roots. Um, you know, often if you're going to put in some irrigation line, you might need a trench and you might need to prune some roots then. Um, and then the other big time that you need to prune is at planting. Because we tend to have really poor root structure because of the way we grow our tree stock in containers. Um, what happens, and I forgot to show you my other wood. I'm not going to be popular with the janitors here. So this is a root ball from a real tree. This is a really extreme one. If you want to look at this after I'm done talking, you can see that there's a, a kind of a square from the original container that that little seed was planted in. And this was left in the pot way too long and the roots just went round and round and round. Um, the one on your right up there is even more extreme. That one was in the ground for a while before it died. What happens is, let's see if I can make that stand up there. Um, a root that's growing around the trunk, especially, can choke that trunk out. It's called girdling. Uh, and, and eventually it could kill the tree. Not only that, you need your roots to be growing out for stability's sake. So if you have a tree that's circling round and round with those roots, it can very easily be blown over in a storm um, or, or just knocked over by kids playing or who knows what. Sometimes on new plantings, I can walk up and wiggle the trunk and you can see that original planting ball, even after a few years where the, the roots are just growing in a circle and it has no stability at all. So when that happens, you might need to prune some roots. Uh, this is an example. This is my parents' house, um, kind of northeast Austin. I know it's difficult in this picture to see, but there's two main trees in their front yard. Uh, they're both oaks. The one on the right is a red oak. The one on the left over near my dad's pickup that's smaller was a chinkapin oak. Those trees were planted at the same time about 13 years ago when I was in Wyoming, so I didn't plant them, I'm not to blame. But the, the red oak, the bigger tree, it was actually smaller than the smaller tree at the time of planting. It was planted correctly, and was able to establish roots and grow. The one on the right, the, the roots were never cut when it was planted. So this is what we found when we took an air spade to it and exposed some of the roots. Um, that that I'm pointing to is this giant girdling root that's growing right next to the trunk. We sat there and had a debate about it because my mom really didn't want to cut down this tree, but it had dropped its leaves in August, two years in a row, so we knew it was really sickly and it, you could just tell by looking at it, it hadn't ever grown or established so we decided to go ahead and take it down and my husband blew off all the soil from the roots so we could see what was going on and you can see it was just a big spaghetti bowl mess of roots it never was able to establish roots outside of that original planting container size and because of that um, it, now it's very very difficult to see this in the picture but if you look really closely you can see the wood on the top side kind of top right of that tree trunk is actually dead. That part of the, the trunk where that big girdling root was coming around, 
had been killed already. And there's decay in there. There was even some borers already that were starting. That tree was never going to make it. It was already dying. And that was 13 years of time, of water, all just wasted because the tree had no chance. And it's all because of what happened when it was planted. So you can do something about this. Uh, but it's really important when you're cutting in pretty much any part of the tree, but especially roots, you want to have nice sharp tools. So before I talk about making the cuts, I just wanted to point that out. Um, I would keep a separate set of tools to, to prune roots than you use to prune the, the canopy of the tree because soil really, really dulls your tools. So, um, you know, you, you might want to just have those in another little bag, another little tool bag. Oops. Giving away my secrets. Okay, so I just got back. I got to go to the neatest thing. I, I was in Florida last week. First, I went to this totally nerdy, the cost of not maintaining trees symposium, which was really interesting, but I won't bore you with it. Um, but we, then I got to go to the International Tree Climbing Championship. Um, I got to go because I'm lucky enough to be on the, the board for the International Society of Arboriculture, the Texas chapter. Um, and so they sent me down there to spy on Florida because International's coming to Texas next year. So we're going to try to do it bigger and better. But um, um, when I was there, I, saw, I learned some new root pruning techniques from Dr. Ed Gilman. He is literally the man that wrote the book on pruning. And I recommend if any of you do a lot of pruning or are interested in getting into pruning, it's uh, an illustrated guide to pruning, the third edition. This is gold. This is a really, really good book, and it talks about all kinds of pruning. So just a little plug for Dr. Gilman. But anyway... I came back and changed my slides for this presentation because he's, he's, through a bunch of research, updated the recommendations for how you prune uh, tree roots at planting. So what he recommends that you do is the first thing, you kind of look down, get the soil back away from the trunk. You want to see where the flare is of that trunk, where the trunk is meeting the roots. And that part should be exposed. That part needs to be at grade when you plant so that you're not planting too deeply. Um, if you see roots like this that are starting to circle at the top of that root ball, you want to go ahead and cut them. That's where my fun little shears come in. So just snip those off and then pull them back. Get them off the trunk. Um, what we used to say was to, to turn the tree ball on its side and slice it like a pie, like slice down on all the sides, because we thought it was important that you cut, cut those innermost roots down in here that are circling too, because oftentimes you're going to have Every, every container that that nursery bumped those tree roots, they're going to have a, a root circling in that size. But what he's found through research is that those that are lower down don't matter nearly as much as the ones up here next to the trunk. Those are the ones that can kill the trunk. So kill, or excuse me, cut those first, remove them, and then after that, slice the side of your root ball. And depending on if you're planting a five gallon, it may only be an inch, maybe a half inch. If you're planting a bigger tree, you may take off a couple of inches. What you're doing is you're getting all of those outside roots that are starting to grow around and around and you're just cutting them off. And then when that tree sprouts and sprouts new roots, which it will, they're gonna grow out. Um, I don't know who this girl is. I found her on the internet because I forgot to take a picture of somebody slicing roots. Um, but I thought she looked really cheery and happy. I don't know that I'd recommend that type of saw, but if it's sharp and it works, I guess so. Um, all right, I'm going to switch gears to my little uh, preaching about tree roots at planting real quickly and get into um, other types of, of root pruning. Uh, I know a lot of you are landscapers. You may, you may put in patios, sidewalks, that kind of thing. Uh, you may do irrigation. So we do have some regulations in Austin you need to be aware of if you're doing any work um, in, the, in the area that we call the critical root zone. This is the area that's deemed the most important part of the roots that you really have to keep. Um, city ordinance protects the critical root zone. So I'm going to explain this to you. It's all based on the size of the tree. And, and they, they base it mostly on the diameter of the trunk of the tree. So the way to, fi to figure out what that critical root zone is, is you measure the diameter of the tree trunk at four and a half foot off the ground, as arborists call that diameter at breast height. Um, you know, we have a little fancy, we call them D tapes, diameter tapes that do the math for you, that you can measure around and it tells you the diameter across. If you don't have one of those, use a regular old tape measure it around, and then divide by 3.14, or pi, and that will give you your, your diameter. 
So in this example, you have a 21 inch diameter tree trunk. All you do is convert that one for one from inches into feet. So this tree would have a 21 foot critical root zone radius. And remember, that's just the radius that's going out from the trunk in one direction. But it's going to be doubled that to protect both sides, so 42 foot critical root zone. And the city asks that you protect that whole part of the root zone. Are we, oops, man, I'm bad about that. Now we do make some exceptions. Um, you need to work with your site plan reviewer uh, through the permit process, through a site plan process to, um, to get permission to, to do any kind of impacts. Um, but we do allow you to um, make impacts up to 50% of that critical root zone. But keep in mind, anytime you do this, you're damaging roots, you're taking away roots, you're taking away the tree's ability to take up water and nutrients. So minimize it, at, it if, if at all possible. Within the half critical root zone, uh, the area went halfway back on that, that circle. There are a f only a few impacts allowed, and this is by permit only. Especially um, if you're on private land, if you've got a protected size tree that's 19 inches in diameter, make sure you're getting your permit for this. Because just as you were going to do any pruning, or excuse me, if you're going to remove the tree, if you're going to impact the roots, you need to have a permit. If you're working on city property, you're going to go through a whole different process, and it'll be very regulated. And you might see Leah here come out and help you. Um, so in that half critical root zone, the city does allow quarter inch cut down, or excuse me, man, my mouth's not keeping up with my head. Four inches cut down, so for a sidewalk installation or something, you can cut down four inches, or you can add four inches of fill. Um, the reason they regulate fill is that fill can act just like um, cutting or compacting roots. It can reduce the amount of, of oxygen getting to those roots and crush the roots and smother them. So no more than four inches cut down, no more than four inches to soil added on top or whatever, any kind of fill. Um, within the quarter critical root zone, the part closest to the trunk, we allow no impacts at all. And that's because if you're getting in that area, you're really risking... Um, destabilizing that tree, cutting something that's going to make that tree just fall over. You know, typically a tree doesn't have that many big roots that are keeping it in place. Maybe five, maybe seven, but often it's only a few roots. Um, that that $14,000 pecan tree I talked to you earlier about, the reason we were out there appraising that tree is because somebody had uh, tunneled right next to it, cut a trench line for a sewer line to come into their house, and it cut about a foot from the trunk and severed every root on that side. And it was a public tree, and so we were, going, we were out there um, to, to appraise the damage and to decide whether we could keep the tree or not or if it was now too dangerous. And we actually deemed it too dangerous because um, it had seven roots and five of those were severed in that process. So we just couldn't allow it to stay up. So remember these, and if you have any questions, you can always call the city arborist's office. They're very helpful. Um, if you're going to make these kind of cuts, you're going to have to get to the roots. So they have tools, they're air excavation tools. This one is called an air spade that basically just blow all of the soil off the roots but don't damage the roots. And they're a wonderful tool. You can use them to lay uh, irrigation lines by blowing your trench out instead of using a trencher and then laying that irrigation line right underneath the roots. Um, you can also use them if you need to decompact soils that have gotten compacted and for all sorts of things. But it's a great way if you know you're going to have to prune some roots to get them exposed so you can make a nice clean cut. Once they're exposed, you just use your nice sharp tools, make a cut. Try not to tear. That's why I want you to use sharp tools to make a nice clean cut. And then get those, those roots covered up as soon as possible. You know, if you're going to have to do this... Remember, if you're cutting really big roots, you might be making a stability issue for that tree. So, um, you know, really think about your choices if you have to do that or not before you do it. All right. I think I got through it all. So thank you very much. Um, we've talked about all types of pruning in a tree. If you have more questions for me, this is my email address. That's our um, program's website. I would be happy anytime you know, I would be happy to help you uh, with your tree problems. That's what we're here for. Um, now, does anybody have any questions for me now? Yes, sir.
Well, the homeowner is ultimately responsible. Um, he was, of course, going to try to get it out of the contractor, but he had to stop where he couldn't get his occupancy permit for the house until he paid from the city. Because usually all of that, if you, especially if you have a site plan review process, a development process um, in place, they have that ability to not give you the occupancy permit until you, you pay your mitigation. So, yeah, you want to be really careful. But they can go after the contractor, too. And in the case of illegal tree removals, they'll find the homeowner and every single worker on that site and the owner of the company, too. And it's not cheap, thousands of dollars. So be careful. Excuse me? Oh, OK. Um, this is a really common question. Really, the best time to prune, uh, especially in our area, would be in the, in the fall or in the winter when the tree is, is dormant. Um, for one thing, you can see when the leaves are off, you can see the structure way better to make your, your cuts. And then the stress that you're creating by making those cuts, you give the tree a little bit of time when, it's, when the temperatures are cooler and hopefully we're having some rains so it can kind of recover before the heat of the summer comes in. Um, if I had to say there was a worse time to prune, I would say spring. When the tree is putting out its new leaves, it's putting a lot of energy into that process. I mean, that takes a lot of energy to build all those new leaves. So if it's also trying to uh, make up for those pruning wounds and close those, it's going to be a little stressed to do that. But, you know, it's not going to kill the tree to do that. If you really have to, it's okay. Um, it's just that's probably the least favorable time to prune a tree. Anything else? Um, there are, you're, currently you're not allowed to prune more than a quarter of the live growth of the canopy. Um, you know, you don't want to stress the tree by taking out too much. Um, other than that, I don't believe there are restrictions unless it's a public tree, in which case you have to have permission. But Oh, thank you. I didn't even talk about oak wilt. Um, yeah, so on oaks... If you're going to, to prune, um, the city does recommend that you paint the wounds immediately after you make them to prevent the, the spores being um, in, introduced into that wound by the beetle that's feeding off of the sap. Those beetles can sense that sap. They can smell it from a long way away. They land on the new wound to feed. They carry the spores on their back, and they introduce um, oak wilt into the tree. So if you're going to be pruning an oak, um, the city recommends that you do not prune oaks between February 1st and June 30th because that's when the beetles are the most active. But those beetles don't use a calendar. You know, they're really dependent on temperatures. Um, so if you've got a nice warm day in November, uh, if you don't have to prune that tree, tree it might be a good idea to wait till it's a little colder. Um, but if you do any time, you want to paint those wounds immediately to make a little barrier to prevent the spores from getting in. We don't recommend paint on any other wounds because they used to think that helped it to seal it off and heal quicker. That's not the case. What it actually does is can trap moisture inside, and it, if it, it may do nothing or it may actually be harmful for the tree. Um, for oak wilt, I would recommend you prune when it's either the hottest time of the year or the coldest time of the year. That's when those beetles are the least active. And keep that in mind for roots, too, because oaks, um, they're... they're Roots can graft, and they can transfer um, uh, oak wilt through the roots, but also you can transfer it if you make a cut and you have spores on your saws. So it's a good time to, or it's a good idea to sanitize your tools no matter what tree you're pruning because there's a lot of, of diseases that can be transferred like a dirty needle. Spray of some Lysol on your tools. It's a little bit hard on your chainsaw chains and bars, but uh, it's not near as bad as bleach. So. I think she was first, sorry. I'm going to run out of time. Is that it? Okay. I'm sorry. I'll, I'll stick around. If y'all have more questions, I'd be happy to answer them. And definitely email me anytime, and I'd be happy to help. Thank you so much. I'm sorry to have to do that, but we have to keep on schedule. Um, earlier I said we expect a lot from our plants and our government and I hope that you've seen some of our city staff are very available to answer questions to help you through the process um, and be successful in your businesses.